Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining the show. Uh, Mike Johnson here. Glad to have the chance to spend a little bit of time with you this morning. And uh, just a little bit of background here. I've been grubbing around middle floors for a long time. And over the course of time, I've had opportunity to get into the process of building, planning, building, and executing machine lubrication programs with multiple Fortune 1000 production sites. Uh, you hang out long enough, people give the opportunity to stand up and sing and dance on stage and write articles. And so that's a little bit of information there. If you'd like to see my CV for other purposes, let me know. A little bit of what we do here at Amory. Uh, this, this title pretty well describes who we are and what we do. We plan, build, and execute machine lubrication, precision lubrication work management systems, including condition monitoring, and from time to time, actual program management. I'm going to cover more slides than I really have time to cover today. So I'm going to go through these quickly. Uh, would encourage you, if you're interested in delivering over the details on any of these things, and there are plenty of details, please do go take a look at the recording and view that more slowly at your leisure. Um, let's go ahead and jump in. We have learned along the way that the industrial world floats on a 10 micron film of oil or so we've been told. The reality is it's not a 10 micron film of oil. It's not even close. The reality is all of your element bearings float, dynamically operating bearings float on an oil film that is that is between one half and one and a half microns. Plain bearings, a bit more luxurious, three to micron, three to 10 micron thick oil film. The reality is you get back and forth to work every day in an automobile, floating on an oil film that's the thickness of a red blood cell. You show up to work and you observe machines doing their thing and they're all floating on an oil film that is actually thinner than a red blood cell. That you're listening this morning is testimony to the fact that this thing works. However, it is still a precariously thin layer of protection. Our objective with our machine lubrication Work planning and management then is to figure out how to apply and reapply the the oil or grease, as it might happen to be, in such a way that we're able to preserve that, call it three micron thick layer protection. If we're not able to preserve that, we know the effects. We lose bearing help, we lose uh, lubricated component help, which produces productive, uh, loss of productive time, whether it's scheduled or unscheduled repair, doesn't really matter. Once time is gone, it's gone. We lose machine repeatability, which has a negative impact on product quality. We have increased risk of injury as we're scurrying around, trying vigorously to get machines back online. All of this creates higher product cost per ton and a loss of our respective competitive position. So what? We got a whole bunch of things going on why should we pour precious resources into this thing that everybody knows is in uh, kind of uh, 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 autonomous mode and, and just out there working on its own? Well, there's a lot of different ways that you could measure success. Increased production rate at reduced repairs and reduced cost. Re just plain old reduced pairs in a production environment. Nip <clears throat> Nippon steel, Kawasaki steel, reduced pairs. Reduce cost of operation. Chemical plant, French chemical plant, uh, reduce risk of injury with improved asset utility. And the correlation goes beyond that. Fewer, less risk of injury with PM, PDM type work, including machine lubrication. Greater risk of injury if we're in the act of making machine repairs. There's different ways to measure success, but ultimately your management group wants to know if they're going to spend one dollar more than they have to or have had in the past on this thing called machine lubrication how are they going to get that money back and that's an appropriate uh that's an appropriate question here's an example of a um, uh, very large paper mill currently operating paper mill on the west coast over a five-year period where they invested a fair amount of money in improvements this total improvement spend line here uh, represents what they spent to make the program better. And if you look at the numbers at the bottom, you see an astoundingly strong three-year improvement, uh, estimated return on investment, estimated savings. And, and this is the mills management reporting 
out to us. This information was presented a couple of years ago at a major international conference. It's show me the money. The reason to do this is because it improves your competitive position. Okay, there we go. What kind of KPIs, key performance indicators should you expect following an upgrade in your daily care and feeding program? Well, certainly reduction in lubricated machine parts and elimination of any labor costs associated with those reductions, reduction in any contract labor for planned or unplanned outages for that matter, increased net production output. And really the reason to do this isn't to reduce your cost of repairs, it is to increase productive output. Uh, a one to 3% improvement in with the existing cost structure produces staggeringly large benefits back to the organization. If we don't manage to make improvements or, or provide uh, lubrication in such a way that we can maintain that three micron thick layer of protection, we're going to get surface rubbing. We're gonna get wear from uh, hard particulate and moisture, wear from fatigue, corrosion, the people that are providing our machine parts, and the very community is particularly strong about reporting the relationship between failures, unexpected or premature failures in machine lubrication. They tell us straight up that there's a huge relationship that exists between what we're doing with machine lubrication and the longevity, the expected longevity of the machine's working parts. This is an SKF chart. Uh, FAG bearings has a chart with similar breakdowns, but Per FAG's bearings perspective, it's not 57%, it's 80% complicity between machine lubrication and premature bearing failure. They're not hiding from the numbers and they're beating the drum asking us to do better. Lubricant film failure modes that we've just saw, they're all measurable, predictable, and avoidable. And again, so what? Your system, such as it is today, is perfectly designed to give you the results that you're getting today. If you want different results, you got to look at the system. You got to have a different design. So this presentation is about steps for program improvement, the design, so to speak. The lubrication program development or precision lubrication development should begin with the measurement step. I'm going to put five steps here, starting with benchmark gap analysis, determining what you see that warrants improvement, creating a plan and moving forward. Step two then of course, is digging into the details to make that plan for improvement a reality. Step three is to do a more vigorous job of integrating condition monitoring <coughs> back into the plan so you can see if this, the corrective actions you're taking <coughs> have actually had a positive impact. <coughs> Step four, tune the process. Make necessary capital improvements to your machines. Make them more machine lubrication friendly. There are multiple vendors out there, Trico, desk case, uh, two liters, uh, check fluid a liter. They're making the fixtures and fittings available to us at a competitive cost so we can make these improvements fairly easily. Step five, build knowledge within your ranks, within your troops. The function or the purpose of today's presentation is to focus on step two, which is the details associated with developing machine specific relubrication practices that you could deem to be reliability enhancing practices. <clears throat> A few things to know about this process we're about to discuss. Reliability center lubrication program development is a detail intensive machine care planning and work management system. We need a plan for collecting and managing a lot of details. Now we need a system for managing and tracking, again, a lot of details, but not at the machine level. We need to manage our lubrication activities to the component. Accordingly, our CMMS program must be equipped with the means to store the component specific details to issue work plans around the component and then give you the means to track and report on what's getting done, what's not getting done. Secondly, the plan should focus on the machine first and the lubricant vendor second. Our lubricant vendors are capable of providing products that will get the jobs done that must be done. However, 
we should look at what we are going to do through the prism of machine criticality. Well, liability priorities should drive the kind of, of uh, augmentations you make to your machines. The higher the criticality, the more tightly we want to focus on the specific machine elements, the component type, size, speed, load, and environmental challenges. And then adjust our, our plan according to machine criticality and the duty cycle. We cannot do all things for all machines. We're going to have to be selective. So we start with those machines that are our bread and butter kind of machines, those that must be running in order for us to make orders today. So we got a bunch of machines out there. We're going to have to go through this process. Let's take a look at the steps here. Um, typical process pump, motor bearing, or a motor. We're not going to lubricate the motor. We're going to lubricate the outboard bearing and the inboard bearing, and they may be different bearings. They may have a different plan requirement. We're gonna lubricate a coupling, if there's a coupling that requires it, and then we're gonna have a pump body where we've got multiple points of interest to manage. The higher the criticality, the more complex the plan would be. Let's think about the amount of details that we must, must process. A single critical pump. If you look at the number of lubrication tasks for a critical pump that are gonna to need to be done each year. You're looking at as many as 63 discrete visits to the pump to do something. And that would include uh, an unusual step, sampling for the pump to make sure that uh, the mechanical parts are, are behaving well, they're in good health state. So let's just say critical pump, 63 tasks for a single direct coupled FD fan, force draft fan, as many as 30 tasks. For a single critical conveyor, you consider all the machine's parts, all the bearings, all the tasks associated with the machine parts, as many as 204 visits to the machine to fulfill a function every year. Even if you have a relatively small uh, uh, plant asset group, 30 conveyors, 30 fans, 500 pumps, which would be a fairly small size plant, if you add up all the tasks associated with machine lubrication and condition monitoring and machine health management with a small plant size like that, you still have the means to produce 39,420 tasks in a given year. Lots and lots and lots and lots of details to try to keep up with. For a large production site, 2,500, 3,000, 3,500 assets, it's entirely likely that you will have hundreds of thousands of visits that must be managed to the production machinery on an ongoing basis, on, a, on an annual basis. So, you know, back to the old saying, the devil is in the details. We want to do this properly, then we need to have a plan for managing the details. So we're going to go through the process here for pulling together those details, assembling them into a plan, and then executing the plan using task management software. Site-wide machine requirements survey is going to have to be done, and there are steps to that. First step would be to create a floor plan that gives us the means to create the linear sequences we will call routes that are both efficient and thorough. Secondly, we got to get all the machine details gathered together and into a, a record system to tell us what must be done, when, why, with what, and how much. We log each component by component type we log the meaningful nameplate and design details we may revert back to the oem's guidance we're going to log the environmental influences by and large the oems will offer thoughts from the component manufacturers but we're going to get most of the information we need right off the plant floor from the machines themselves step one is to create a structure that shows the physical location of all the machines and it doesn't have to be a fancy uh, three-dimensional mapping software that shows where every spider web is in every corner of the plant. When we get into producing a work plan, step one is to map the facility. We use Excel. The diagram you see here was created with Excel. It's very easy to do, gives us the means to identify each and every machine and then validate the proper name and asset number and give it that we're, you know, when our second or third CMMS program and we've got all kinds of asset numbers uh, attached to the machines out there, this is an important step. 
whatever we collect from machine lubrication work management needs to match the CMMS machine management system. <clears throat> so create a floor plan, show where all the machines are, name them, number them. Once we have the floor plan created, then we sit down with the loop technicians and their supervisors and say, okay, let's create an efficient linear sequence. And we start where the, the, the entry door is, and we plot out using a little red crayon, the linear sequence that represents the pathway that we should be able to use to get to all of the assets with as few steps as is humanly possible, such that the workman is not wasting time wandering hither and back and forth because they don't have a good, well-detailed work plan. Step two, create the route sequence. Step three, we go back to the machines. And now we're gonna look at all of the components of all the machines. We got a motor, we got a coupling, gearbox, drive shaft, we've got uh, bearings on both sides of the shaft for a conveyor, we might have a backstop, we might have snub pulleys to take up pulleys and other odds and ends. And we've got to get all the details for all the components well defined. So we're going to study the individual sub and sub sub and perhaps even sub 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 component details. Make and model, size, the number of each, the type of part that we're lubricating, the specific part details, all of these must be addressed. Additionally, when we're building our plan, we're going to recognize the faster the machine's running and the larger the component machines, machine's components relative size, the more attention we're gonna have to put into the machine to assure reliability. So we need to know the size of all the components, their operating speed, their relative loading. We can only assume that the machine was built by people that understood what parts to pick to support the loads that were the original design specifications. However, our second favorite game in the manufacturing world is, of course, to speed it up, increase the load, make it run faster, get more output from the existing mechanical footprint. Uh, oftentimes, we will upgrade a machine to the point where the individual components no longer do provide adequate load-bearing characteristics. Well, we can't make that judgment call while doing the machine lubrication work planning and development. We must go with whatever parts are present and then get into the details and beg the question for machine upgrades after the fact. Lastly, the operating environment in your production facilities has a tremendous and possibly negative impact on the longevity of your lubricated machine parts. In building the work plan, we got to take your operating environment into consideration. Most of our information, as I said previously, is going to come right off the production floor, but our information sources are defined the physical equipment themselves, OEM guidelines, that's original equipment manufacturer guidelines, generic industry guidelines, such as ISO or DIN standard or ASTM standards. Uh, for our part, we advocate calculating what can be calculated. We have to have a plan for doing that. Calculations are not expressly complex but there's a lot of calculations which you will see here in just a minute okay so let's take an example um, determine lubrication requirements we're going to talk about a few simple components starting with our element bearings and i'll use an electric motor nameplate here because it's up, you know, visually appealing it gives us the means to think through all element bearing decisions <coughs> So we know where the machine is in route sequence. We're gonna go out and look at the nameplate for the motor. We're gonna identify the bearings that are buried inside the motor. We're gonna identify the operating speed. We're gonna take the temperature and we're gonna use the details from the bearing design and operating speed at operating temperature to make the decisions that we wanna make for the electric motor bearing and all other element bearings and journal bearings as well. It's a good example. We know that the larger the bearing and the faster it's rotating, the less effective grease is going to be 
the less likely we're going to be able to achieve 100% of our expected bearing life cycle. So we need to know whether it's safe to lubricate with oil or grease. We got we to gotta make a decision between one of the two. Oh, we need to do a reality check to make sure that that's okay. So step one, <coughs> using bearing manufacturer's guidance. <coughs> Sorry about that, folks. Using bearing manufacturer's guidance, we're going to determine if it's okay to lubricate a bearing with grease. <coughs> bearing manufacturer says the NDM value is going to give us a general yes or no uh, pass fail on the prospect of the use of grease. So we're going to run a calculation. NDM is shaft speed times the bearings median diameter. ID plus OD divided by two gives us a pitch line velocity of the bearing. <coughs> um, plugging the numbers from the bearings we were just looking at into the equation, 40 millimeters plus 80 millimeters divided by two, 120 millimeters divided by two, 60 millimeters times shaft speed gives us the NDM value. This is an attribute from the bearing itself. That was for the bearing furthest from the coupling. The bearing closer to the coupling is slightly larger. So we have two numbers, 113,425 and 104,000. <clears> we compare those numbers to the speed limit values provided by the bearing manufacturers for ball bearings and we see that we are well below any kind of risk associated with the use of grease. Step one, determine the NDM. Step two, compare NDM to the stated values and make a judgment call. Is grease okay? Yes or no? In our example here, yes, it's okay. Step three, regardless of whether we're lubricating with oil or grease, we've got to pick the product from the vendor supply options that assures us that we're going to make a work plan that will allow everything to float. If the elements cannot float in the races because we have an oil that's too thick or too thin, regardless of whether it's oil or grease lubricated machine, we're depending upon the oil thickness at operating speed and operating temperature to float the component surfaces. So we need to determine what the product proper selection would be. <clears throat> We can either calculate the requirement or we can plot the requirement on a table out of the bearing manufacturer's lubrication guidance book. And every bearing manufacturer has a chart that looks something like this, <coughs> where we could find the bearing <coughs> median diameter. Give me just a second. I'm going to slurp on the throat lozenge while I'm talking. My apologies. That'll be better than coughing. The bearing median diameter at operating speed gives us a targeted drop dead viscosity value. So we can plot it or we can calculate. For our part, our customers expect us to give them objectively correct answers. So we're calculating. Minimum allowable viscosity is a constant factor times shaft speed to the negative 0.7 power times the bearings median diameter to the negative 0.52 power. We come up with a value. We multiply that value by three to give us the target for the operating product selection. Once again, from the motor that we were looking at, we drop in the relevant values. We come up with a um, minimum allowable viscosity times three gives us a target viscosity. <coughs> we look at the product that we have in use. And let's say it's an electric motor bearing. And let's say that we're using grease that has a ISO 100 viscosity grade. As, uh, as you look at your motor bearing grease, you'll find this is pretty uniformly the case. And let's say the operating temperature is 50 degrees C, 122 Fahrenheit. At that temperature, the grease that we have <laughs> picked for the bearing gives us a working viscosity of 60 centistote. We said our target was 49. <laughs> We're setting at 60. It's a good match. Our best fit would be a product selection that is somewhere between three times and five times the drop dead viscosity. Um, 
using a temperature viscosity chart like this, it's pretty easy to make that determination when looking at our various element bearings. The next question, step five, is whether we should pick a grease that has an EP characteristic to it or not. If we're able to make a viscosity selection decision that gives us an expectation for having oil that's thicker than one times the drop dead requirement, and we're on the right side of that one number, we don't need EP. If on the other hand, there is no product that gives us the means to do that, we're on the left side of the one times drop dead value. In order to get close to the bearings, bearing manufacturers <coughs> adjusted life cycle expectation, we're gonna have to use an EP fortified product. We make the proper product selection. Typically, we should not be depending upon EP fortified greases or oils if it's an oil lubricated component. Step six, determine the correct volume, replenishment volume. If it's an oil bath, it's relatively easy. We bring the oil level up to the fill line. If it's a grease lubricated component, a bit more complicated. We are interested in supplying a grease that is adequate to fill the void that exists between the two races and around the element between the two axial sides, axial planes of the element. Uh, as it turns out, while that would seemingly be a complicated thing. It's not. The width of the bearing times the OD, the bearing. <laughs> if we're measuring the bearing in millimeters times the space factor, we see it down here. 0 0.005 times 80 times 18 gives us a stop point when we're replenishing the bearing with grease. We know exactly how much grease ought to be put into the motor and or other shaft bearing following a simple rule. Part of Part of doing precision lubrication is having the tools in place that gives us the means to accurately apply quantity once it's defined. So we can purchase a grease gun that gives us the means to dial to a specific volume, or if we like the grease gun we have, and for instance, for electric motors where we want to go at a much slower pace, put a volume meter on the grease gun. They're inexpensive, they're accurate, mash the button, zeros it out, we have a target volume, and if we know that the bearing requires 7.2 grams and no more, then we get 7.2 grams and we stop. <clears throat> Next question is one of how often should we feed? Now, for a given bearing, we might want to feed more often or less often, depending upon operating conditions. The faster it's running, the larger the component, the, the more often we're going to need to feed the bearing or check the level on the bearing to assure long-term productivity. Without a calculated value, we end up with intervals and volumes that are, are uh, pretty unsteady. With the calculation, we have a starting point that gives us the means to be very accurate in identifying how often we should go about replenishing that small quantity of grease. And then of course, we can validate that with our sensory tools, uh, ultrasonic energy detection. So. One more calculation. Uh, the fundamental aspect of the bearing is defined by what we see inside the parentheses. Well, inside the first set of brackets. K represents the product of six environmental factors multiplied together, as we see in the right side of the chart here. We go out at the bearing, we observe the temperature, we observe the contaminant load, the moisture load, we observe for any shock loading, we might need to get back with our vibration guys and ask them specifically about uh, shock loading and, and we can gauge that in inches per second impact. Uh, shaft position, horizontal or vertical, and then lastly, the bearing type itself. All of these have an influence on how often we should go about doing the care and feeding routine. So we drop the numbers in, we come up with a value and we get our interval in hours, which we convert to days. Now, we have the beginning of a plan. We want to validate that the planned calculations that we've run through actually do fit the operating conditions of the machine. <coughs> Our ideal scenario would be to use compression wave analysis, which we will refer to as ultrasound generically, to determine whether the oil film is intact and we are in fact floating the elements against the races. 
this uh, compression wave energy is very high frequency energy, but it can be detected if we are set up to do this with the right approach. When doing this, what we're actually looking for is evidence of impacting energy created by asperity contact. If we drop a steel ball onto steel plate, the impact creates a compression wave. If we have a sensor parked in the right spot, that compression wave can be easily measured. This is compression wave ultrasonic energy measurement. Once the ball hits the plate, it deflects. This is vibration analysis. They're very different types of measures looking for very different mechanical symptoms or, or issues with the machine. Inside the bearing, <clears throat> We have an oil film, if it's intact, if it's uh, in fact enabling us to float the machine parts, we're rarely going to see bumping and rubbing of the machine surfaces. But as the oil film degrades, whether it's an oil or grease lubricated bearing does not matter. As the oil film degrades for whatever reason, we have more severity contact, which creates compression waves. <coughs> um, yeah, sorry. <coughs> If we have the sensor set in the right spot, we can identify that this is occurring. We can measure in decibels. We can make adjustments to our lubrication routine, and we are back off to the races again. So those rules that we just reviewed pertain to element bearings of all types. As you would guess, there's rules for couplings as well. The trick with the lubricated couplings is to recognize the centrifugal force applied to the grease that we're depending upon for long-term coupling use. <clears throat> the bigger the coupling diameter in inches and the faster its operating speed or uh, rotating shaft speed, the greater the centrifugal force applied to the lubricant. So when we look at couplings, we grade them according to their operating condition grades. Uh, AGMA has provided CG1, CG2, CG3 operating condition grades, and then correspondingly, our grease manufacturers have provided us with lubrication characteristics that are the right fit for those different operating conditions. We find the coupling grade, we find a product from the vendor selection that is the best fit, we make the match, and we move to the next component. And let's say the next component is a gear drive. Well, wouldn't you know it? There's rules for gear drives as well. The rules are based upon based upon the gear itself. Okay, we seem to be up. Ah, there we go. The gear itself, and we got two gears that are in mesh. We're going to measure the speed of the gear based on the gap between the pitch line diameter in millimeters. And of course, since the gears are interconnected, they're going to have the same pitch line velocity. The lubricant selection is based upon the pitch diameter in millimeters divided by, multiplied by shaft speed and divided by a constant factor, 19.098. Uh, there's uh, uh, tables provided by AGMA that correspond to the operating conditions besides the speed of the gears that gives us very specific insight into which viscosity is the product fit for the operating conditions. There's rules for bearings, rules for couplings, rules for gears, rules for splines, rules for hydraulic selection, rules for everything. We just need to follow the rules that are provided by our machine designers. And again, the mostly the information that we're gonna to use to make these decisions will be found from an inspection of the machines themselves. We collect our individual details. We drop the details into a calculator. We use, <coughs> those calculated values to set our work plan. For our part, when we're doing this, we recognize that we've got a couple dozen different calculations to do. And given that we are only very slightly inherently lazy and, and not inclined to make all those calculations manually, we did the thing that uh, any technology company should do. We built a copy of software that gives us the means to pull all of the information together into one spot so we can define the machine itself for the CMMS program. We can define all of the component criteria one at a time with all of the relevant details, bearing size, speed, operating conditions. That gives us the means to calculate a proper interval. 
There is no one size fits all mechanism for determining grease replenishment for electric motors. Despite the fact that IEEE and Electric Apparatus Service Association give us a one size fits all, if you want a precise plan, you got to build a plan around each individual motor and its inherent risk characteristics. And the same for couplings and the same for the other driven components downstream of the motor. Ultimately, we need to end up with a profile of all the machines by name and number, their type, the component, and the, and the critical details for the component, and then all of the associated details related to having an effective machine lubrication plan with the volumes and the triggers calculated to match the operating state of the machine. Once we have that, that, that uh, set of data, we're going to create a database by department that shows us the name and type of each asset. And for each asset, we're going to drop in all of the relevant details. From there, as you recall, we collected this information in the linear sequence. So if we've done our job pre-planning, defining the routes, and then getting all the details together, once we drop the details into our test management system, we're going to have the linear sequence that represents the most efficient approach. So here we have a list of all of the components for this utilities department in the proper sequence. <clears throat> Once that's done, that is the route. We're going to begin scheduling activities out of that route. Now you'll notice we've got 24 activities or, or 24 task types that have to be executed in some kind of a periodicity over the course of the year. And our trigger values tell us three months, six months, one year, one week, one week, one year, six months, so forth and so on. Obviously, we're not going to see all tasks show up each week. We're only going to get a small fraction of those tasks as we've done a good job balancing out the workload. So the task management system then should represent to us which tasks show up in this particular work week that are due for attention. <clears throat> a healthy task management system is also going to give you the means to automatically <clears throat> automatically roll any activity that was missed for whatever reason right back into the next work week so that nothing falls through the cracks. Your task management system also should give you a representation of the number of tasks and the number of hours needed to complete that route for that weekly schedule. There are many companies that are uh, migrating today towards electronic tablets. That's a good idea. But there's also a lot of old timers out there that uh, really, really don't want to use a computer. So it needs to be the means to print these results out to a sheet of paper that give us, whether electronically or on printed paper, visual cues to show us which things are now in arrears and must get attention this week. The heart and soul of precision lubrication is putting the right quantity of the properly selected product in the right location at the right frequency and the right attitude. This creates a precise state where we're able to float our machine's working parts. And then lastly, with the task management system, you want feedback about the components and their respective details and the tasks what's getting accomplished, what's not getting accomplished. Most CMMS systems don't have granular characteristics, fields, if you will, to actually hold the details that we would like to have reported upon. Most CMMS activities, uh, lubrication programs, are text scripts, and you might have 10 or 100 text lines in a weekly work plan for lubrication poured out of SAP, but if it's a text, field, Excel, Word document, or whatever, you can't actually track what's being done. you got to have a place to hold the details to be able to create reports to give management the means to track what we're getting done so we can avoid missing things. Bottom line, without a quality plan to manage the details and focus, focus, focus on completing the plan every week, we're going to drown in the details and drown in ineffectiveness. There's so many tasks that we must 
attend to on an annual basis with our lubrication plans. We, we just can't wrap our human brains around the amount of things that need to be tracked. After you're done, there's always room for improvement. We should look at our, our management schedule. We ought to be accomplishing 90% of the tasks that are scheduled on a weekly basis. That would be a, a grade letter B plus, A minus at 90%. <coughs> If we're not able to do that, we need to examine the routes. Now, if we have too much activity in specific routes, not enough activity in other routes, we can balance those routes out by dragging machines from one route to the next to give us the means to get that A grade on our weekly activity. We should look at our oil analysis results, and depending upon how often we're actually doing our testing, if we're testing on site, testing critical machines, that ought to be incorporated, at least superficial analysis incorporated into weekly and biweekly activities. <coughs> we look at our control limits and compare what we get and adjust. With the amount of turnover that's occurring in the industrial world these days, uh, and the fact that we don't teach this stuff in school, grade school or college, <clears throat> we need to be focused on building knowledge for the technicians responsible for delivering these so that those employees become contributors from the chin up as well as the chin down in helping us manage and improve the quality of our lubrication programs. And then lastly, going back to the starting point, benchmark, build a plan that ought to have one to three year targets, goals and objectives. And then based upon that plan, let's do a quarterly review. Let's see what kind of results we're getting. And if we can't get what we thought we were going to get, let's change our plan. Precision lubrication is the all-encompassing basis for mechanical reliability and productivity. It, it's simply a matter of physics. If we don't get lubrication right, regardless of the fact <clears throat> that we may have accomplished precision installation, precision balance, precision alignment, we get all of that right, that's great, but we can still suffer relentlessly if we don't have a very tight lubrication work plan. And here's a way for you to gauge whether you have a tight work plan. You look at your, your net um, routinely scheduled, and uh what's the phrase what's the word <clears throat> uh emergency scheduled unscheduled activities machine repairs good grief look at your network plan if you have a high percentage it should be should be 20 percent or less if your percentage of corrective repair work orders relates to replacing machine parts it's above 15 or 20 percent then there's an opportunity for you through machine lubrication to drive down the workload. That's a simple metric, but it's a good one. Lastly, and I'm going to step back to kind of the, you know, 30,000 foot manager's view here. When you talk with your management group about the value of improving daily essential care, look at this through the prism of your maintenance budget. A typical maintenance budget is going to have divisions that we show here. Roughly 40% of a typical budget, I might vary up or down depending upon the type of production environment, 40% is related to machine parts that are being replaced. The lubricant slice is only 1% to 3%. The miscellaneous materials, light bulbs and shop gloves and pencil sharpeners and what have you, 12 to 14%. Net total, 60% of our maintenance budget is related to stuff. <clears throat> Um, actually, it was 55%, sorry. 45% um, of our maintenance budget is related to time, either salaries or wages and or overtime. So if you look at the proportions that we have here, this, this 1% to 2% here has the means to directly impact our base labor component, certainly our overtime labor component, and in roughly half of what the purchasing department spends out of components, which is related to lubricated machine parts. This 1%, 1 to 3%, gives you leverage over everything related to 
of the line items and the maintenance budget. Machine lubrication gives you fantastic leverage over ongoing machine repairs, but you got to take a granular look at the details. If you don't like the result you get today, you need a new plan. Machine lubrication is a high value opportunity. Strong relationship between the quality of this program and the replacement of machine parts. <clears throat> After 35 years and work with lots of industrial facilities and seeing what they have accomplished, I would characterize improvements in machine lubrication wherever you get your help from, wherever you get your parts from, does not matter. This is a best buy in the maintenance world. You have the means and the discipline to manage. Uh, you must have the means and the discipline to manage a very large amount of detail. So you've got to look at the system that you're going to set up for work manage, developing and then deploying work management. Okay. We have a few minutes available for questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mike. Your knowledge and expertise is truly invaluable. And as you mentioned, we do have some time for some live questions today. Uh, if you do have questions, go ahead and enter them into the question panel of your GoToWebinar screen and submit them on over for Mike to answer. Just as a reminder, they are um, answered anonymously. And if we do run out of time and don't get to all the questions, we'll pass them along to Mike so that he can reach out to you and make sure they do get answered after the webinar. All right, Mike, we did have a couple of questions that came in while you were presenting. So we'll go ahead and get started with one of those. Right. Uh, the first question is referring to temperature changes and fluctuations and how that might be um, uh, put into plan and a plan of action or how you might implement that. Yep, okay, that's a great question. Here's a rule of thumb for you. If you can put your hands on the machine <clears throat> without either flash freezing or burning your skin, and we call that temperature between minus 30 and 150 degrees Fahrenheit, if you can put your hands on your machine and leave your hands there for more than a few seconds, then you don't necessarily benefit that much from having a synthetic in place. However, if you have big temperature swings and over the course of temperature swing, you see those kind of heat loads or cold loads, you really ought to be looking at a synthetic. And the synthetic inherent capacity gives you the means to sustain the viscometric, uh, uh, sustain the oil film much more effectively than a mineral oil product. So in that scenario where there's some variability, variability in operating speed and or temperature, I'm gonna be looking at a synthetic, to cover the gaps that can't be uh, can't be covered effectively by a mineral oil based product. And then I'm going to go back to one of the principles of the presentation, the higher the machine speeds and the bigger the parts, the more often we're going to have to focus on those machine parts and the daily care and feeding routine. Next question. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mike, for taking the time to answer that one. Uh, our next question is kind of going off of what you were talking about with the budget. Um, this person is saying they're under immense pressure to reduce expenses of their lubrication program. Uh, yep. Do you have any insights on how to handle that? Yep. So you got to go back and look at your task frequencies. <clears throat> you got to have a duration of each task defined. Let's let's uh, take a simple example: greasing a shaft bearing, supporting a fan. All right, so the workman's got to log in and go to the morning safety meeting, and then go to go to his bench top, wherever, get his tools, get out to the machine, and put six grams of grease into that bearing. Now, the work done at the bearing that might only take ten seconds, but we've got a budget for all of that other stuff that must be done. And after studying on this with maintenance managers that are working for me and also working for customers, we've come up with a prescription where we believe it is right to divide all of the workman's time into a, a duration value in minutes for each task. So that when we're looking at the frequency of scheduled tasks 
and we're looking at a time assignment for each task, we have the means to very objectively gauge how much labor needs to be applied. Just because we used to have 10 oilers doesn't mean we need 10 oilers. Just because we've got two doesn't mean we shouldn't have four. If we don't measure the amount of time required to fulfill the task, there's no possible way we can make the right cost control judgment call on the labor component. Now, the uh, the proportion of labor to lubricants is uh, about a three to one to five to one. For every dollar you spend on lubricants, you'll spend between three and five dollars on labor managing the process. So if you're thinking cost control, you really ought to be looking at the schedule, the frequencies, the durations for each task out of your out of your labor requirement for your program. There's where your big dollars are going to be found. But don't be surprised if you actually do some calculations and come up with, uh oh, we really need four people. We only have three. Well, invest in the fourth person because you're trying to drive down cost of manufacturing, not drive down the cost of applying grease. The best way to drive down cost of manufacturing is to make sure your machines are available to operate anytime that production department wants them to operate. And we can't do that if we don't float the machine's surfaces effectively. Uh, as it relates to the lubricant cost per se, this is really overstated. I'm going to go back to, uh, I'm going to try to get back here. Yes, this, this sliver. Now, if you're in a paper mill, the sliver is 2%. If you're in a steel mill, the sliver is 3%. If you're in general manufacturing, we're talking about 1% or less <coughs> of the maintenance budget is dedicated to the lubricant. Okay, if you got a million dollar budget, there's probably room to re actually reduce that value. But even if we completely eliminated purchases of lubricants for a given calendar year, we're still talking about a rounding error for the maintenance budget. And the maintenance budget may well be a rounding error for the whole of the operation. We can't, we can't really control costs by focusing on the lubricant per se. Having said that, the last thing you wanna do is change oil for a machine. Changing oil only eliminates symptoms that drove a decision to change the oil. It doesn't fix the underlying conditions. So with your condition monitoring program, you wanna dig into the alarms and limits, the values that you're using with your lab and make sure that those values truly accurately pertain to machine health needs in, in deference to or in favor of vendor needs. Vendors use oil analysis to, uh, to encourage people to change oil. And that's not evil, that's their job. That's what they're supposed to do. But there is also a fiduciary responsibility to use that information to improve mechanical reliability. The last thing you should try to do is, is change oil to solve a problem, dig into the details with your uh, oil analysis program. Next question. Excellent, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, we will continue to encourage you to enter questions into the question panel of your GoToWebinar screen, but we will wrap up with one last live question today for you, Mike. Uh, okay. And this question is asking about uh, the platform. Which kind of platform do you recommend to use to submit our analysis, lubrication results, and keep monitoring through time? Okay, uh, that's a tricky one. <clears throat> Depending upon who your vendor is, they have a web-based platform. Most of these web-based platforms give you the means, once you learn the in inherent capacity of, of each of these platforms, you see there's the means to do a lot of reporting. Most of our Fortune 1000 size manufacturer, manufacturers are using uh, business knowledge mechanisms, Tableau, Power BI, things of that nature. And if you can get to the granular data from your oil analysis platform or whomever's running your Tableau Power BI program, they can get to the, the server that's a repository of the data, then that data can then be the specific parts you're looking for can be incorporated into your business management business knowledge system. Uh, I, I I don't really I don't really have uh, 
an example of, of I'm not going to point you to a specific one. There's lots of good labs out there. Uh, Polaris, um, uh, Wearcheck, uh, oh, the folks in Cleveland, can't remember their name. Uh, SGS, oh, I can't remember their name. There's, there's, there's four companies out there. I wish I could think of the name of the fourth. You send me an email, I'll, I'll think of it after we hang up and I'll send you a, a reply to your email and tell you which it is. Well, there's good vendors out there that have very robust systems for reporting oil analysis data. The trick is making sure that your desires for the, the alarm types and alarm limit values are buried into that web-based reporting system with your oil analysis vendor. The capacity is there but you got to make that happen if you want it to happen. Otherwise, you're going to get motherhood and apple pie generic alarm limits and values. It's not evil, but it's also not efficient. I'm willing to hang on. I don't have anything else scheduled till lunch, uh, and, and that's only lunch. So I'm ready. I'm, I'm willing to hang on for as long as anybody else has questions. All right, perfect. Thank you, Mike. Um, we'll go ahead and do another one here that came in because it's asking for your view on replacing grease lubricated bearings uh, with air oil, not air mist. Repeat the question again. Yeah, uh, re they're asking about replacing grease lubricated bearings with air oil, not air mist. So replacing, replacing, changing lubrication mode going to air over oil, and I would say or mist, they're both excellent approaches. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so that becomes a design question. Um, obviously, you'd look at your failure modes and beg the question, why Why are we failing? Do we have the right product pick? Bottom line is, if, if, it's, if the NDM value is violated, you're not going to achieve bearing manufacturer's stated reliability expectation using grease. You're not. It doesn't matter what you're doing. you got a problem with the, the viscous characteristics of the oil and the grease, and it's just not going to work out well for you. So in those instances, um, am I is my screen still showing? I switched it over. Do you want me to send it back to you? Yeah, send it back to me. I want to. Sure, no problem. Start here. All right, showing my screen again. Okay, so my, uh, my PowerPoint is behaving like a sluggard, so let me see. Give me just a second here. I want to go back to a specific, to a specific chart. Come on, PowerPoint. Well, it was a good plan. I were close. Okay. All right. All right, this chart here. Okay. So the bigger the bearing and the faster the shaft speed, the more quickly we're going to violate the Indian value associated with greed lubrication. If it's a ball bearing, and let's say we got a four and a half inch shaft and it's turning at 2400 RPM, and you run the numbers, ID plus OD divided by two times shaft speed, you're going to come out with something that's above this value. Now, that is not a you're all going to die today kind of statement. It represents the fact that that bearing needs to have, needs to have oil versus grease in order to operate for that 30 years that the bearing manufacturer says it should operate. <clears throat> Even if you're force feeding grease, those applications ought to be evaluated for a change from oil, I'm sorry, from grease to oil. Just moving from a grease bearing to an oil bath would be a big improvement. Moving from a grease bearing to either mist or air over oil would be a better improvement. <clears throat> Well, the bottom line is uh, we need to make sure that what we have in place is an acceptable technical fit prior to making a redesign decision. You know, I'm not sure I answered that question very well. 
you send me an email, I'll try to answer it in writing a little bit more succinctly. That's perfect, Mike. And I think this next question might kind of play on the same topic. They're asking about their manufacturer and the manufacturer of the machine has recommended a type of oil uh, and they are looking for an equivalent. They're asking, apart from the viscosity and temperature, are there other characteristics to take into consideration? Absolutely. So there's four chemical family types of lubricants available for us to use. Three of those pertain to industrial oil, industrial grease, chemical families. <clears throat> the fourth is a uh, passenger car, motor oil, gasoline or diesel fired combustion engine. So let's focus on the three. Depending upon the part types that you have to lubricate, where you have steel running against a soft metal, brass, brawn, or babbitt, there's no benefit from you using an EP or AW fortified product in most instances. The EP characteristic, the AW characteristic require on contact energy or depend upon contact energy from the machine's lubricated parts in order to bring a benefit. We can't get the right kind of contact energy if the film fails us where we have sliding contacts to make the AW or EP part of those chemical families work in our behavior. That unfortunately, that is active chemistry in the lubricant and it can definitely work against us. So, operating temperature range, viscosity limits for high temperature and cold temperature conditions, operating conditions. Shaft speed cannot be understated. The shaft speed is a huge influence in your final decision. And then lastly, regardless of what the machine builder says, go back to the component builder. You know, look at this through the prism of, of the bearing manufacturer and beg the question, if we can make the right product choices, do we really need AW slash EP chemical characteristics? Most of the time we don't. I'm going to say one other point related to a machine builder saying, hey, you have to use this type of grease or that type of oil. Um, the component builders would probably be better source of advice about the objectivity that's being expressed there. Most of the machine builders, they don't, they don't soak in this. They don't know more than you know about the lubrication requirements for your operating machines. And really what they do know is that they're giving you a suggestion, but it's in motherhood and apple pie. One size fits all suggestion. You may run that blower at a higher temperature or lower temperature than their default expectation. Even if they give you a, you know, a, a, a temperature range or speed range for the blower, the fan, the hydraulic system, whatever, you got to look at this through how you're actually, the, the prism of how you're actually going to run the machine. So there's there's different pieces of information that needs to be considered there. I know there's tough supply chain disruptions. We've been you know, fortunate to receive a, a, the benefit of a lot of consolidation help requests recently. So uh, your your question is timely. Uh, once again, if you like more insight, send me an email. Other questions? Perfect, thank you. And I think the a few questions came in surrounding um, how long to kind of implement a change or implement a plan and then reevaluate its success, how often and how long, I guess, you should wait between doing those things. Yep. Okay, that's a good one. Benchmark your benchmark your program. Uh, if you'd like, a, uh, like to read an article related to benchmarking, send me an email. I'll send you a, a published article about what you really want to look for, how you want to do it. Do that on an annual basis. The first one you do needs to be soaked in details. But once you do the first benchmark and you figure out which way you're facing and you figure out which way you need to turn to make improvements, from that point on an annual basis, mostly you're benchmarking the improvements that you've made, um, maybe adding new details if the reliability structure, production structure for the site changes, but something ought to be done on an annual basis. When you do the first one, build a three-year plan. <coughs> Excuse me. The plan may change in six months, but hey, you got to start somewhere, right? Build a three-year plan, 
set yourself up with quarterly reviews so you can maintain some decent pace with making the improvements. Do, um, do somewhat of a plan review on an annual basis and keep pushing the ball forward. <clears throat> if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Uh, that's point number one. But without a vision, the people will perish. The people that are doing this work need to understand that there is a plan that is going to be tracked, <clears throat> that the results are important, and that's going to get chin-up participation from everybody involved in the process. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, we are going to go ahead and wrap things up. But before we do that, is there anything else that you would like to add today? Uh, yeah, I, I think I heard also a little bit uh, about maybe how long does it take to build out a machine lubrication and precision lubrication program in the last question. Uh, let me reflect upon that a bit. <clears throat> if you are doing roofing work, somebody calls and says, hey, I need a roof. You say, okay, no worries. I've been doing roofs for 35 years. You show up, you look at the roof, you say, yeah, it's going to take, uh, you know, six days and the materials cost to be this and labor cost to be that and what have you. If you do this work day after day after day, you derive the value from experience that influences the timeliness for getting the work done. If, on the other hand, this is your first time on the roof or maybe the second time in 20 years on the roof to replace shingles, your work pace is going to be different. So how long does it take to build a plan? Well, from for each of the steps, from, from drawing up a floor plan and defining the routes and going back and collecting the information that must be collected and assembling it together, you ought to be able to average with with just you know a decent knowledge starting point 10 to 15 assets a day from start to finish for our part we expect to do much better than that but then once again we've been doing roofs for 30 years so um there's a a, a, a time experience component here uh if you have the time within your existing available responsibilities dig in. There's lots of public domain information that's available to help guide your perspective about what needs to be done. You go to the education part of the Amory webpage, there's 30 articles there that address building machine lubrication programs. Feel free. It's all it's all available with a click. Um, lots of information resources. But critically measure whether or not you really have the time to dig into this thing yourself. Time and time and time and time and time again, I see young reliability engineers that are tasked with, hey, build out the lubrication program, make it better. And they get into it and they spend four weeks and, and then something happens over in the back corner of the plant. You got a leak in the fire control system. Oh, yeah, look, you, you got to keep building lubrication plan, but now we want you to take over the fire control suppression system. And, and sorry, that's a higher priority. So you need to get right on that because there's insurance people looking over our shoulder and another three or four weeks pass and something else happens oh we have a waste disposal issue look here you know we didn't hire you to do the waste management but somebody really needs to pay attention to this and now that you're finished with the fire control thing we need you to jump on this and get this squared away and we live under the tyranny of the urgent measure measure the amount of time you have to put into building one of these things be honest with yourself and be honest with management. For our part, we expect to average 25 to 30 assets a day for the entire process, from soup to nuts. But um, and, and you know, if you can, if you can manage that pace, then you're in excellent shape. Okay, I'm available. Anybody has a wish to contact, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest in this topic. This is a high value use of your time. Uh, go in peace, be warned and filled, and do the best you can. Thank you so much, Mike, for your time and for your presentation. Sharing your experiences 
like I mentioned before, so invaluable to many. And on behalf of our entire team here at Mobius Connect, we're also thankful to our wonderful audience for joining us, for asking these great questions today. Just as a quick reminder, the recorded version of the webinar will be made available on CBM Connect, and you'll also all receive it in an email tomorrow. You can see a full list of upcoming webinars and other educational content on CBM Connect. You can also visit CBM Connect dot com directly to see at other educational resources that are on demand. If you're interested in engaging with other industry professionals or would like to participate on the industry's live feed and ongoing forum discussions, you can do so by heading to mobiusconnect.com. You can also follow us on social media at Mobius Connect so you can stay up to date with all of our latest community happenings. If you do have any questions at all, you can always email our team here, info at Mobius Connect. Uh, we will make the connection for you. If you do have further questions for uh, Mike, we can pass those along as well. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you all have a great day. Please stay safe and we will see you again next time.